As an engineer, I've mixed and mastered countless tracks, and while most people deliver proper pre-masters, occasionally someone sends me tracks that are simply unmasterable. So here's the top five mistakes that really get your mastering engineer's blood boiling. If this is your first time here and you want to learn all about FL Studio and music production in general, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and the bell as well. Number five, hey, please make my track sound like this artist. Fortunately, that doesn't happen often, but sometimes people ask me to make them sound like a certain artist, believing that the mastering process can actually totally transform the way the vocal and their track itself sounds. Naturally, they're going to be disappointed, since mastering is more about enhancing what's already good in a track. You can mitigate small mistakes here and there, but any huge changes should be done in the mix instead. A reference track, of course, is okay, but don't expect your track to be magically transformed. Number four, people sometimes ask me to edit out breathing sounds, loud pops, clicks, and so on. Recently, someone placed an order for mastering, and the vocalist was reading from some papers. The papers were so close to the mic, so it made loud crackling noises. I had to explain I couldn't remove this during mastering without degrading the entire track. Again, this should be done in the mix itself, not during mastering. Number three. Every now and then, I find that quieter parts of a track, like the intro and the breakdown, are not dynamic enough compared to the drop. When the track is mastered, it therefore sounds too loud during the breakdown, making the drop lose impact, which is not ideal. I'll explain this in more detail later in the video. Number two, wanting to make changes afterwards. This one is fairly common. A track will often sound different after mastering because sounds get pulled up due to compression. The relationships between sounds might therefore change, and this catches some people off guard. I'll explain how to avoid this later in the video. Number one, this is the most common and most blood boiling mistake people make. Sending in a track that's heavily compressed and limited with no dynamic range and no headroom to work with. When a track looks like this, there is nothing for a mastering engineer to do. I have very clear ordering instructions on my page, but sometimes people even try to cheat by adding volume automation to the master knob, so that technically there's several decibels of headroom but it's still heavily squashed. All you can really do then is bring it back up. So don't be that guy or girl. Don't make your mastering engineer's blood boil. You'll probably want your track to sound as good as it possibly can, right? In that case, here's my top advice on how to properly prepare your track for mastering. When your track is finished and you have everything mixed down, it's time for mastering. You can master the track yourself or use one of the available online mastering services such as Lander, Emastered, and so on. Or you can send it to a mix engineer to have it mastered. In any case, before you start the mastering process, you need to make sure that everything checks out, that all the levels are good and everything is sitting well in the mix. When the track is mastered and released, there's no going back. Before you send your track to be mastered, make sure that you don't have any mastering effects on your master channel, such as compression or limiting. Automated effects such as filtering, reverb, and so on are perfectly okay, though. It's essential that you have enough headroom. A pre-master should have at least 3 to 6 decibels of headroom. It doesn't really matter if you have 5 or 10. The important thing is that there's room for the engineer to work. If the track peaks at zero or above, then the engineer will basically have nothing to work with. Most engineers will ask for three to six decibels of headroom. That's also a good amount of headroom if you choose an online mastering service. It's a good idea to drag your exported pre-master back into your DAW to make sure that the waveform checks out and that there are no inconsistencies. Verify that the low energy sections are more dynamic than the high energy sections. When the track is mastered, everything will get pulled up, so in order to ensure that the breakdown and such remain dynamic, 
it needs to be quieter than the drop. Before you send your track to be mastered, I recommend using a limiter on your master channel temporarily. You can then gradually increase the levels and see how it affects the dynamics throughout your track. This can help you avoid any unpleasant surprises when you get your track back from mastering. If you feel that some elements end up sounding very differently or the breakdown sounds too loud, for example, then you can go back and make some adjustments before sending it out to be mastered. This is a good way to partly simulate what the mastering process will do to your mix. Just make sure to disable the limiter when you're done. Last but not least, make sure that the file format is correct. Always export it in a lossless format. I recommend exporting it as a high-quality WAV file. MP3 files are smaller in size, but you lose quality, so you don't want to use that for your pre-master. Most people use 24 or 32-bit here. 16-bit will be required if you intend to put it on CD. I recommend enabling high quality for all plugins and select the highest quality option here. If you need professional feedback on your music, mastering, and so on, then check out the links below. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you like this video. And as always, let us know in the comments below what kind of tutorial you would like us to make next. Thanks for watching.